Do you have a second to talk about our saviour, the Polax? Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now I've spoken about pole axes in the past and I've shown this and other pole axes on here before, but what I've not done previously is trained, I won't say intensively, but trained regularly over a relatively compressed period of time with the pole axe, but that's exactly what I have been doing in the last few weeks. Now I have occasionally taught pole axe sessions throughout my life um, within my HEMA classes, but I am preparing for an event this weekend, which is a armoured event, um, and we're going to be focusing on pole axe uh, principles and also particular sources as well. And this has highlighted to me some things about the pole axe, which maybe I slightly realised, but I now realise them more potently, um, or I just didn't realise at all previously. So this video really is going to be about looking at some of the things that I have found out and observed about the medieval pole axe that I think that you might find interesting to know. Maybe some of these you'll know already, some of them uh, will uh, be new to you. Um, and I'm going to share with you some of my observations here. But before we go on, we're going to have a super quick integration from the fantastic sponsors for this video, who are Raid Shadow Legends. Raid, of course, is the hugely popular turn-based fantasy combat game. You can get playing right now for absolutely free on your mobile or PC. If you love badass arms and armor, amazing gameplay, and awesome graphics, then Raid's for you. One of my absolute favorite bosses is Sir Galaroth, guardian of the Arcane Keep. Unlike most of the other Potion Keep bosses, this dude's actually a pretty nice guy, sort of like a paladin. But the hitch here is that you have to beat him up. And he can be really tricky if you're not ready, but he's one of the more straightforward boss battles in Raid. Raid's got a ton happening this month with a fresh rotation of the brutal Hydra boss and a ton of events and tournaments every single day, including some special Valentine's Day events where you can get your hands on a brand new legendary champion. This is an amazing time to get started with Raid, and you can do it by clicking the free link below here under my video or the QR code on screen right now. And by doing that, you're going to get some really cool bonuses. We're talking about a free epic champion called Tayrel, 200k silver, 1 energy refill and 1 XP boost and one Ancient Shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get into game. All of these cool gifts are going to be waiting for you up here in the inbox and remember this is only for new players and only for the next 30 days. So get clicking and I'll see you in game. Thanks very much for sticking with us now let's get back to the main content of this video which is looking at Polax and some things that I have observed about it. Uh, very very briefly because I have talked about this topic in the past for those of you who don't order Polaxes I'm holding an example of it here. They're a weapon which is really specialized for fighting in armor. More about that in a second. Um, they have a top spike, they have a bottom spike, they have um, either an axe and a hammer or a spike in any combination. So the first thing that I'm going to point out to you about the pole axe is that it is an armored weapon. Um, in other words, it's a weapon which is really optimized for use by people in armor against people in armour. You can see that this example is about the same height as me and in fact there are various reasons why you wouldn't want a Polax to be particularly longer than that and I'll talk more about that in a little bit um, but fundamentally this is a relatively short close-in weapon that was used both on the battlefield and also in armoured duels sometimes to the death sometimes uh, purely as sport. Um, so this is a weapon which very much is designed to be used in harness and it's not really optimal to be used by more lightly equipped infantrymen for example. They might go for something like a, a glaive or a bill or a halberd which has got greater length and for the most part many of those don't have something on the back end. Glaives sometimes do but certainly halberds, bills and spears tend not to have a, a back end spike on them and they spend a lot of time being stood on the ground I should think. Uh, but pole axes uh, quite specifically in the treatises always have something on the butt end. Now I should mention if we actually look look at the manuscripts not all pole axes do have something on the back end this incidentally has just really got a little metal knob ideally this should really be a spike uh, more or less akin to the one on the top, top end actually and if we follow the actual treatises or manuals of use for pole axe they make extensive use of the back end but more about that in a minute so really once again to summarize is overall use it is not a great weapon for an unarmored person to be using against people who've maybe got spears or glaives or halberds they're going to have an advantage because those are lighter longer in many cases more nimble weapons uh, that are more catered towards their needs these 
are really optimized for people who are going to be fully um, encased in armor, wearing gauntlets and all of that kind of jazz. Um, so this is very much a specialized armored fighting weapon. Now the next thing to say about poleaxes is that any part of them can be used for offense or defense. Specifically in terms of defense, what a lot of people don't necessarily uh, realize um, is that the poleaxe is often used backwards. Uh, whether we're looking at um, a very popular source, a French source called Le Jeu de la Hache, which means the play of the axe, um, or indeed, or poleaxe more specifically, um, or indeed if we're looking at the anonymous Bolognese source um, from about 1500 probably, uh, which shows the anonymous Bolognese that's commonly used, uh, uh, commonly referred to, um, uses the poleaxe and the tail is used a lot. Equally, if we look at things like Fury and Vardy, Talhofer, uh, so on and so forth, um, Palo Sector Mayor later, um, then indeed the tail is used uh, an awful lot for that. More about that as well in a second. But by and large, we've got uh, three main sections of the polax. Okay, you have the tail, you have the middle section between the hands, which is in French known as the demi hash, um, and then you've got the shaft above the hand up here somewhat akin to a sword blade I suppose in the way that it uh, binds relative to your body and then finally you've got one which sometimes uh, goes unnoticed by people who don't study in particular the polack sources and it's this area up here which is known as the cross uh, in French and I imagine it was in English as well. So essentially when you're doing anything against the opponent or against their weapon, you've got the tail, you've got the middle, you've got the um, section above the hand here, and then you have the cross as well. And in terms of the offensive bits, obviously you've got a tail spike, you've got a top spike known as the dag or dagger. You have a, if you have a spike, then that's called uh, le bec de Corbin, uh, which is the beak of the crow, um, so crow's beak spike or you've got a hammer, mato, martel, um, or, uh, and you have in some cases an, an axe or a hash. Now what are the relative strengths and weaknesses of having those different things? By and large an axe is going to be more useful against more likely armoured people or people who've got any kind of um, soft uh, fabric covering or flesh or anything like that that you can chop into. But for fighting armoured opponents really the most useful parts are going to be the hammer and the spike or beak, which this doesn't have on it, incidentally. And actually, if we look at whether it's Fiori, Vardy, Anonimo, or Le Jus de la Hache, they all make reference to the beak, um, the back spike, which this doesn't have. Now, it must be said, these types of axes with a hammer and an axe seem to have been particularly popular in England, very popular in England, for whatever reason. Um, and also pretty popular in France as well. However, by and large, it seems that the type which has a hammer and a spike is what's more referred to in the treatises. So as well as using these uh, three main or four main sections, the tail, the middle, above the hand, and then the cross in defensive purposes, they can all be used offensively as well. Obviously, you can stab and thrust with the back bit. You can shove with the muddle, middle, middle bit. Um, you don't generally hit with this part, but this can be certainly be used for defensive, as we've mentioned. And then obviously you hit with the two bits here, and you can uh, stab with the dag at the top as well there. Um, in addition to that, this cross as it's called, so the, the cross piece, whether it's a hammer axe, spike, whatever, um, can be used for hooking and pushing as well. So in certain circumstances the um, spike, the beak sticking out the back, or indeed the bottom edge of the axe can be hooked around the back of the opponent's knee or the inside of their arm and used to pull, or indeed it can be used to pull against the opponent's weapon as well. Additionally the top part of the cross can be used to plant into a person to push them away, um, or indeed to push their weapon away. Um, so this uh, pulling and pushing is very important element of poleaxe fighting and is done both against the weapon and against the person's body and or armor and in some cases it's specifically used against the edges of the armor or the straps of the armor in order to try and hook on and manipulate the person or pull them over make them fall or indeed to actually break the straps so part of the armor exposes the soft fleshy innard uh, which of course you could then stab into. So the next thing that we've learned um, in this intensive poleaxe training period is that slipping and sliding of the hands is incredibly important in poleaxe fighting and it goes both ways. So sometimes um, you you know generally speaking you're going to be holding the poleaxe somewhere in the middle and you're going to be using the back end and the top end and incidentally 
Incidentally, I'll just fleetingly mention as well, it can be held either way around. Although predominantly in the treatises, they tend to mostly hold it with the right hand towards the axe, uh, because most people want to give a right-handed blow from here. When you're wearing armor with a breastplate and uh, arm harness and pauldrons and everything else, it's not really practical to try and give a, a strike from this side by crossing the arms over, because it's just not very comfortable with the breastplate and, and not a very effective blow. You could do it, but it's, it's not really uh, described much. I don't think it's ever described in uh, Le Jus de la Hache, for example, which is one of the most detailed um, poleaxe fighting sources we've got. So uh, predominantly strikes are given from this side, and then if a strike is given from this side, it's going to be with the tail. So either end, with passing footwork, you can't see because it's off camera here, but with either end, um, by passing feet, left foot forward striking from the left, right foot forward striking from the right, um, you can strike with that. Obviously the strikes with this end are not going to be as potent, but the thrusts are going to be just as potent as they are with this end. And in some ways more important, um, again I'll come back to that in a second, but slipping the hands is super important. If you want to give a strike, whether it's in a duel or battle, a bit further away, you can slip this hand down as you swing so that you can um, power up the blow quite quickly and nimbly and then slide it out to hit them from further away, which will be less controllable. It's harder to stop because your hands have now come down to the end of the weapon with a lot of inertia at the end, but it will hit with an awful, awful lot of power. And additionally, if you're fighting in a melee or skirmish, for example, it means that um, you can hit someone from a lot further away who might not, might not even see it coming. But this slipping of the hands doesn't work in only one direction. Whilst hitting with the head is what a lot of people think about and focus on, very often we're doing things with the tail end of the weapon, and that actually requires you to slip the hand up here. And believe it or not, there are techniques, <laughs> there are techniques absolutely where you slide the hand fully all the way up to the cross. Now what this gives you is essentially a spear at the back end, so the tail end of the pole axe, but additionally it means that the cross end, that's an anvil I'm hitting in case you're wondering, um, uh, the cross end is now very close to your hand and very manipulatable, if that's a word. Um, so for example, um, there's a technique whereby someone's come in to throw you and uh, they've displaced your axe to the side and the tail of their axe is across your um, throat, or across your helmet actually. Um, and so what you do is you slip your hand up to the um, head of the axe, you plant the cross in their armpit and you push them away like that. So there are absolutely situations where you do this. There's also a technique where you parry a blow that's coming down at your leg by slipping the hands right the way up the shaft to here I'm, I'm sticking the tail end of your axe down here and having done that you then slip the hands back up and I'll talk about that guard in a second back up to here to hit them back in the head now that guard you'll notice when I'm slipping the hands that guard is a problem and this is one of the most interesting things and surprising things I think I'd never really realized uh, until relatively recently probably about a month or two ago that those guards are a it can be a poisoned chalice. <laughs> so, first of all, um, in terms of these guards, they seem like a perfectly good idea, don't they? Okay, they block the hole into the uh, gauntlet there, and it means that there's no stab that's realistically going to be able to get uh, into my hand because that disc covers it, much like on a rondel dagger or something like that. Okay, however, a <laughs> couple of problems with that. First of all, Anyone who studies these sources spends a lot of time with the axe that way round. <laughs> so if your axe is that way round, but your guard's now behind your hand, okay? So it's only when the head is forward that way that that guard's really useful. Secondly, as you will see, we often want to slip the hands up and down the shaft. And so long as you keep the hands below that guard, it's not really a problem. You can use that as a hand stop, and it gives you extra force to shove and push and stuff like this. But if for any reason you want to slip the hand above that, you've basically got to let go of your own shaft, so to speak, <laughs> uh, and grip it above, momentarily above the guard. And then if you want to get it back down again, you've got a problem. Yeah, okay, you can hit like that, but if you want to get any amount of leverage, you've now got to move the hand back down below the guard. So honestly, that guard's kind of a pain in the butt. It's kind of in an annoying place for me. And I think my next poleaxe that I get, I'm not going to have a guard on it, I don't think, because they're, they're, to me, they're more versatile without that guard on. 
I would also add, I've been looking at manuscripts a lot recently <laughs> with pole axes in uh, for other research purposes, and I've noticed that some of these guards are actually mounted way up there. So actually they wouldn't protect your hand so much when it's down here, but when you slip the hand up there, you've still got a guard up here, and it means you can slip the hand a lot further up the shaft, so to speak, without the guard getting in the way. So clearly, and if, equally, if we look at things like Talhofer, for example, um, we'll notice that the pole axes very often don't have a, a disc guard here. They don't in uh, Fiore. I don't think they do in Vardy either. They're not mentioned in Le Jus de la Hache or Anonymo Bolognese. We've only got text, we don't have pictures with those, but they never mention a guard. So I kind of have started to wonder if these um, guards are actually quite contentious in period. Some people are very pro, some people are anti, um, and maybe there was some <laughs> debate about whether to have one or where to have it. Um, so interesting kind of detail, I think, about the design of pole axes that I've only really learned from working with these pole axes sources uh, a bit more intensively and actually training this stuff regularly. So another thing we've noticed trading with pole axes, now uh, funnily enough this is actually highlighted in the text of Le Jus de la Hache. So it makes a really big point in Le Jus that when you strike at someone, if you miss or they step back or whatever, um, then you don't want to let your axe fly all the way through and use so much force that you now expose yourself to them hitting you behind your weapon. Okay, so if you make a big old whoa, hard as you can swing, and they just step out of the way, Whoa! you end up down here because it's a top heavy weapon, you end up swinging way wide and making yourself really exposed to their counter attack. So actually it kind of accentuates giving blows but stopping in line with the person so your point is still forwards and ready to thrust even if you miss or get displaced. Now. That's interesting uh, because of course it, it shows that pole axes have to be used somewhat uh, conservatively to some degree because if you use them too hard then you expose yourself in a dueling context or even a battlefield context. But there's another element to this as well. If you swing a pole axe really hard, do you know what often happens? It breaks. <laughs> now medieval art, I've known this for a long time, but medieval art is actually full of examples of broken pole axes. <laughs> often there are broken pole axes shown on the ground. Now if you look at the design of this weapon, it is essentially a, a long wooden shaft, so therefore with a huge amount of leverage, and pretty much most of the mass, if I just put it at the balance point, I'm not even sure where the balance point is, it's about there. Okay, the balance point is pretty close to the head. Um, now, we have got loads of langets to hold this shaft together. And I have mentioned this in, in previous videos, where one of the main purposes of those langets is actually to protect the shaft from breaking under its own energy, essentially. Now, what we've noticed in training is our training pole axes, which are wooden, we don't use metal-headed ones most of the time, um, have taken a punishment <laughs> um, and if you put a lot of energy into a swing and the opponent puts a you know strong demi hash block in or a block with the top of the weapon or a block with the cross it, it puts an enormous amount of stress and strain on this part of the shaft here just the fact that you've swung it at them and it suddenly stops or collides with their weapon makes it very likely that your wooden shaft is going to break even inside these langets so pole axes are uh, look incredibly robust, almost indestructible, but they are really not. And in many ways, because they are heavy weapons, they're almost their own worst enemy. It's easy to, easy to overpower with them and expose yourself, and it's easy to overpower and break them by swinging them too hard. Another thing we've noticed, certainly working through Le Jus de la Hache and Anonimo Bolognese, is there is comparatively little um, grappling or wrestling in the pole axe sections. Now, we could wonder why that might be the case. What there is a lot of is a lot of pushing away, okay? And it can be pushing away with the cross, it can be pushing away with the tail if you get it lodged in someone's armpit, for example, or even on their breastplate. Um, and there's pushing away with the demi hash, so between the hands. And this often buys space, it, it's often done defensively, but it often buys space, you shove someone away, and then once you've broken the space, you either stab them in the face or hit them in the head or whatever. Um, so in actual fact, 
we often talk about, and I've often talked about on this channel, how in armour, specifically in full plate armour of the 14th and 15th centuries and 16th, um, you get a lot of grappling and wrestling when we're looking at sword or dagger stuff. Now, there's always wrestling with dagger stuff, but with sword stuff you see an awful lot of half-swording and coming into the clothes and wrestling. But funnily enough, in the Polak sections, there isn't very much. Um, and the question is why? Well, first of all, there's a lot of wrestling which is extremely difficult to do in armour. Okay. Secondly, what type of armour are they wearing for Polax fighting? And is it the same type of armour as we see for the sword, for example? And the answer is no, not always. Okay. So sometimes if you are specifically armed for foot combat, one example is that you might have uh, smaller spaulders rather than large pauldrons, but additionally you might wear uh, a long fold or tonlet. In other words, your skirt, if you want to call it that, comes down lower, which actually means that you're more restricted in how you can stand in a stance and how you can uh, move your legs around to some degree, but it's extremely protective and more, more importantly, it's extremely difficult for the opponent to for example, grab you around the thigh and try and throw you because they can't get to your thigh because you're wearing a tonlet. Um, so what we found is certain types of armour actually can make grappling very, very difficult. But moreover, and I think more specific to the Polax, there's the issue of the fact that you are holding a large weapon which has multiple attacking options with hooking and chopping and hammering and stabbing from both ends and leverage and the bar, the put, the bar in the middle, the demi-hash in the middle. And I actually think that, generally speaking, uh, it's quite difficult to wrestle with someone who's holding a poleaxe because there are so many options for getting that wrestling person away from you. But if you're the one wanting to wrestle and you're holding a poleaxe, well, very often grappling in armour is done with the left hand while the weapon is in your right hand. Hmm, this is really not a great weapon. Now, if we look at uh, Fury and Vardy, we do actually see some arm locks and stuff where the pole axe is just kept in one hand. But honestly, I mean, Fury has quite a small pole axe. It looks almost only like chest height uh, in some, some of the illustrations. But generally speaking, a pole axe that's person height, trying to do anything useful with this in one hand, yeah, okay, I've got, I've got uh, an enveloping uh, Ligadura Mezzana or whatever, I've done a, an arm bar on you, but trying to then do anything useful with this pole axe is really, really difficult. It's only really a useful weapon in two hands. It's, it's crap in one hand, <laughs> completely unwieldy. So I think that one of the other reasons we don't see much uh, grappling and wrestling in the Polak sections is fundamentally because you've got both hands on the weapon most of the time, pretty much all the time. So the final little detail that I'm just going to impart uh, that we've noticed during our training recently is that the specific shapes and details of the cross, so your, whether it's your axe or your bec de corbin or your um, hammer, really can make a big difference to... Uh, what is uh, easy or practical. So in terms of hooking, for example, there are certain designs of spike which are straight. They very much are not as good at hooking as a slightly curved beak is, or even a very curved beak. But you could argue that the straight ones are better for striking. So if you're you know, hammering it into a uh, mailed armpit or back of a leg or something. So there's, again, there's always, there's always a trade-off. There's always pros and cons. Uh, equally, an axe blade is actually quite good for hooking. So a lot of people fixate on the fact that this is an axe and has got an edge, but actually what we've also got here is a hook. Um, so, and equally for pushing. Now, if we're defending, if someone swings a blow at my head, there is a defense you can start from uh, either way forward, but there is a defence where you literally just jam your cross up into their descending blow. And if you've got a nice big angle here, it will catch it more reliably. You can catch it anywhere between that point and that point, and it will funnel it down to here and catch it and block. However, trying to do the same on the other side, you've got a much bigger margin for error. And even if the shaft comes down here, it's more likely to pop out, bounce out, or just slip out after you've made the cross. So the specific details of the hammer or spike or axe can make a huge amount of difference to how easy it is to hook things or block things or strike things in some cases as well. Um, so there we go. The, you will notice that pole axes um, vary a lot. And I think this is why it's because there's no perfect design for pole axe. No one settled on this is the formula for the perfect pole axe. 
because everyone will have different preferences of technique, whether they want to hook more or um, parry more with the cross or whether they might parry more down here so they don't, they're not so worried about the shape of that. And equally, that decides whether you was one of the things which decides whether you go for an axe and a hammer or an axe and a spike or a hammer and a spike. Um, these are all combinations that give different benefits uh, and sometimes drawbacks as well. So I hope that has been moderately interesting. I'm absolutely loving learning more about pole axes, sticking my armour on and, and practising these techniques. And I have to say also that there's lots of things that armour inhibits you with doing, but using a pole axe is one of those things that seems to make a hell of a lot more sense in armour. Um, and it just doesn't really feel great as an unarmoured weapon at all. But in armour, it makes perfect sense. And um, being your arms so far apart so much of the time, you're not really inhibited in the way that you use a poleaxe in armour. It's just a perfect marriage, really. A 15th century or 16th century full plate harness and a poleaxe seem to be a marriage made in heaven. And I'm really uh, enjoying the honeymoon period at the moment. Anyway, uh, thanks a lot for watching. Um, check out the links below and please come back and watch my next video subscribe obviously if you haven't done already. Uh, see you all soon, thanks for watching.